The murder of Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palme 30 years ago has been an obsession for a whole generation of Swedish journalists. Who did it and why? I made a series of documentaries recently about the various people who've written the latest batch of books about it, Jan Gilberg, Sten Flieger and Conny Larsson. All of them claim to have been harassed in some way or other for it. I've escaped that fate, but I too have written a book about Palme. So this, for what it's worth, is my particular hypothesis. Olaf Palmer was an extremely idealistic man. As the Prime Minister of a wealthy, neutral, peaceful country, he took sides against militarism, colonialism and oppression all over the world. He believed in peace and humanitarianism, and condemned evil wherever he saw it, loudly. In the years before his murder, he alone tried to bridge the gap between the two superpowers, armed to the teeth, in a world teetering on the edge of nuclear war. Then, one day, his country, Sweden, started to get harassment from mysterious submarines here in Horsfjorden Bay, an attempt to sabotage Palmer's efforts and to destroy him politically. And then he was assassinated. But who did it? The answer may surprise you. This is a murder mystery story set in the 1980s, but extremely relevant for this year, 2017. In America, President Trump, in many respects Palmer's opposite in personality, is reaching out to the Russians to defuse the new Cold War and being attacked for it, which reminds me personally of the vicious campaign Palmer experienced in the 1980s, both at home and abroad. Is it the same kind of forces opposing Trump that opposed Palmer? And isn't Trump in danger of facing the same fate that Palmer did? Let this documentary serve as a warning. Olaf Palmer was killed on the 28th of February 1986 at 11.21pm. He was walking home from the cinema with his wife Lisbeth. They had just been to see a Swedish art house film on one of their rare weekend nights together. It was cold, still snow on the ground, minus seven. It's never been explained why he was walking home without bodyguards. Late one winter's evening, the two kilometres back to his flat in the old town, Lisbeth was never able to give a good explanation. It's true that Palmer lived in one of the world's safest countries, but no man in European politics had amassed so many enemies as he had due to his high profile in humanitarian affairs. He was certainly a courageous man. The South Africans hated him for being a most persistent critic of apartheid. Palmer had Oliver Tambo, the ANC's exiled president, over to barbecues in his family home. There had been a big anti-apartheid conference in Stockholm just a week or so before the murder. Vi har stött ANC i många år, i över 20 år. Och vi fortsätter stödet. Men nu så har förhållandena i Sydafrika förvärrats. Och dessutom så känner vi oss inspirerade av er aktion. Så därför beslöt regeringen igår att satsa 5 miljoner extra på stödet direkt till ANC och dess humanitära arbete. The Americans disliked him because he was a very vocal critic of American meddling in Central American affairs. Sweden was the first country to bestow aid on the radical left-wing Sandinista regime in Nicaragua. Palmer was the first Western head of government to visit Daniel Ortega to massive cheers. But Reagan had called Nicaragua a totalitarian dungeon and the CIA had mined the country's harbours and blown up bridges, convinced that Nicaragua represented a Soviet toehold in the American continent. Palmer made enemies in the Middle East because he was the United Nations negotiator in the Iran-Iraq war and thus earning the hostility of both sides. And then Palmer made enemies in NATO, especially London and Washington, because of his big private peace project the so-called Commission on Disarmament and Security, to bring nuclear disarmament to Northern Europe. His opponents feared that neutral Sweden, under the activist Palmer, threatened the unity and integrity of NATO. Palmer's whole political life had been characterised by idealism, or from an American perspective, controversy. Extremely popular with the Swedish working class, as much as he was hated by the Swedish military, 
he combined a Kennedy-esque charisma with the aura of a modern family man. In the 60s, in his first period in office, he'd been the West's most persistent critic of the American war in Vietnam, to the point that actually America withdrew its ambassador for a period. But in amongst the peace-seeking crowd, there were also hawks, aggressors, troublemakers, anarchists. This was how they showed their peaceful intentions against the outnumbered police. Den ständiga upptrappningen av kriget för oss dag för dag allt närmare randen av den ohyggliga katastrofen ett stort krig. But as between the Americans and the North Vietnamese who do you think is the greater obstacle at the moment? It's difficult to say but I there has to be both parties have to adjust their points of view but I, I think also the uh, Americans will have to give away a lot of their positions. But would you agree that now the Americans are not any the greatest obstacle to peace? The I, North well, are just as great an obstacle. Now I would say that as the Americans still are carrying out a, a rather uh, big war in South Vietnam and bombing South Vietnamese cities. South Vietnamese? Uh, yes. I mean from that very fact come that they are the greatest uh, obstacle to peace because in the secret recorded tapes made of Nixon's Oval Office meetings Nixon referred to Palmer as that Swedish asshole but let's get back to the reconstruction filmed here years later for a Swedish TV channel about 300 meters south of the cinema they just passed the brightly lit window of an artist's shop when the gunman who'd been waiting for some minutes stepped out and shot Palmer in the back Another shot was fired at Lisbeth, but missed narrowly, penetrating her coat and leaving her with a burn on her skin. A government meeting was convened and Ingvar Carlsson, Palmer's deputy, was made Prime Minister on the spot, a job, he said later, he'd never had an ambition to have. The next morning there were already many piles of roses at the scene of the assassination. Critics and the investigation said later that the police had been very unprofessional. They had cordoned off only a narrow area, which allowed mourners in too close before the entire crime scene had been properly investigated. Bullets were in fact found by bystanders outside the cordon, for example. they've been standing silently behind the barricades just across the street from where it happened. The people of Stockholm shocked and stunned that such an act of political violence should ever have taken place in this normally peaceful city of theirs. Police collecting their floral tributes and placing them on the exact spot where Olaf Palmer was gunned down. This was his town. He was born here. He lived here. He was proud to boast that he could walk the streets without the protection of bodyguards, and that's what he was doing last night. Across the city they queued outside the cabinet building to sign a book of condolences. A long line of people, all ages, spilling over into Freidsgård, Peace Street. Shuffling slowly and quietly forwards into the building, signing the book, then pausing before a photograph of the late Prime Minister. Wondering why their man of peace was killed. I feel uh, angry, disappointed. I don't think this thing can happen in Sweden. I'm surprised. I think it's terrible. It's a disaster for Sweden. A total disaster. I don't know what to say. <laughs> 
Only one man was ever convicted for the murder of Rudolf Palme. Christopher Betterson was a 40-year-old drunken drug addict who'd been scoring amphetamines in central Stockholm that evening. And while he had a violent past and had even killed a man with a bayonet once in his teens, he couldn't be tied to the murder conclusively. After Pettersson was set free on appeal in 1989, there was a whole plethora of theories investigated with enthusiasm by private investigators, hobbyists, retired policemen, freelance journalists and various other characters. They gathered once a year to vent their theories at a public conference, bringing with them stacks of papers with elaborate, not to say implausible, hypotheses. One popular theory blames the Stockholm police for the assassination, which would go to explain why the murders never been solved. The police were investigating themselves. Some journalists did good work on the police trail. However, while some have made a good case for this, I tend to believe it wasn't the Swedish police who did it, but rather foreign powers. And I believe the murder has to be linked to the great other mystery of the Cold War, the submarine intrusions in Swedish waters. Thousands of observations over 10 years of conning towers, dark shapes and frogmen moving about in the Swedish archipelago, playing games with the hapless Swedish navy that guarded the long indented coastline. The first operation, the Horsfjorden incident, was the largest and the one everyone remembers. In September 1982, the Swedish Navy chased unknown submarines which had apparently penetrated far into the inner Stockholm archipelago, near the top secret naval base at Musker. Journalists from around the world gathered to watch Swedish Navy helicopters and patrol boats drop depth charges and cross over the flat grey autumn sea fringed with islands. Day in and day out, the depth charges continued with unabated intensity. It made for great TV footage. But who was the intruder? No foreign submarine was ever brought up officially, but a commission was appointed comprising MPs, which concluded that the Soviets were guilty. Six submarines, including three mini-submarines, had been part of a harassment campaign of the Swedish coast. The report was lacking in evidence to the skeptics, but the mood in the Swedish media was not favourable to the Soviet Union. We now know that these submarine operations were from the West. They were designed to ruin Palmer's reputation at a time, the early 1980s, when he almost alone believed in dialogue with the Soviets. Fifteen years after the Vietnam War, Palmer was still a troublemaker. What few know is that the Reagan administration prioritised not only psychological and political warfare as a means to win the Cold War, but increased the importance of putting pressure on the Soviet Union's northern flank, the Baltic and Arctic. CIA chief Bill Casey had been in charge of American covert operations in occupied Europe in World War II. He worked with US Naval Secretary John Lehman, who sent carrier fleets into Arctic waters near the Siberian coastline to send jitters through the Soviets. The idea was to make the Soviets feel they were under pressure. It was a high-risk strategy, given that there was always a risk the Soviets would respond with a nuclear counterattack. Alexander Haig, the US Secretary of State, later said in an interview he was astonished by the Soviets' patience. They had plenty of problems on their plate otherwise. A restive trade union movement, solidarity in Poland, calling for the country's independence from the Soviet Union. A failing economy which spent far too much on its military and for whom competing with Reagan's rearmament drive was becoming more and more expensive. On the other side of the world, in Soviet-occupied Afghanistan, Casey and his CIA teams were arming and training the Afghan Islamist rebels with missiles. One of the best-known books about the CIA campaign to draw the Soviets into the Afghan quagmire 
plotted well before the Soviet invasion, is called, appropriately, Bear Trap. The Swedish operations could easily be slotted into what might be termed Casey's covert wars to destroy the Soviet Union. Ulla Tunanda, professor at Oslo's Peace Research Institute, is the recognised expert on the British and American psyops or psychological operations against Sweden. Many Swedish retired Navy admirals hate him because of the way he's exposed their covert cooperation behind the backs of their government. In some areas, what they did would be called treason. But he's not become part of official history, confronted as he is by vested interests and people with agendas, not least today's generation of military men, journalists and politicians, pushing to get Sweden into NATO. And the third point was the submarines. To play Russians in Swedish waters. And uh, uh, what we have, and also you have to say that, that John Lehman said that this was decided already before Reagan entered office. Reagan des decided two major things before he came to office. One was the, the build-up of the 600 ship navy, the, the huge military build-up, and secondly, the deception committee that would fool the Russians totally, and uh, also the Swedes, that it was Casey and so on. And, uh, and then, or actually, the, the concrete running of the operation was done by the, the, the National Underwater Reconnaissance Office, and the head of this was, uh, was Secretary of Navy John Lima. And, uh, and he said before that he couldn't tell which Swedes or involved in these operations because then I then he had to kill me afterwards, and and uh, and then I went up to them and asked uh, asked him which Swedes were involved in this, and then uh, Lehman said I told you before I had to kill you afterwards if I would tell you that, and then Ben Schubach said many people in Sweden would be happy about that, <laughs> and and many means more than twenty. <laughs> so, so that that means it. Well, I was born into the social democracy. I was my my grandfather was social democrat in parliament, and my father was uh, working for the party his whole life, and uh, he became a state secretary, as we say, uh, next to the minister at the Minister of Defense. He was working there from '58 to '67, uh, ten years, and. Um, he was very well acquainted with some of the people in the military circles, like uh, Stig Sydnegren and some others. And uh, he told me uh, uh, in late in 1983, in December, uh, when I visited him at, the, at uh, my in Maristad where he was living, uh, that uh, the submarines in Horsfjorden they were the submarines were from the west. And uh, I, at that time, I didn't take it too much serious about. I didn't take it so so serious. But lately, I, when my father died in 2009, I started investigating this, and uh, I have come to the conclusion that, of course, he gave me correct information. Tunando's evidence is detailed and draws on many sources. The conventional submarine in Horsfjord left keel marks and was silent while Soviet submarines tended to be very noisy and lacked keels. The Royal Navy Oberon-class submarine fit the keel marks and is very quiet. Several recorded interviews that Tunand draws on include admissions from Kaspar Weinberger, US Defense Secretary, and Vigleik Eide, a Norwegian general who chaired the NATO military committee, who both said that Western submarines operated in Swedish waters. One Norwegian sonar operator confirmed on recorded tape that there were Western submarines, and that he was able to confirm that a damaged Western submarine, damaged by a Swedish mine, limped out of the Danish Straits a week later. Bobby Inman, former Deputy Chief of the CIA, said the Americans had installed a secret hydrophone network along the Swedish coast, and he was able to confirm that the Soviets never entered the inner Swedish archipelago during his time in office. It was probably significant that the week Palmer came to office was the week the operations against him started. 
He'd made himself unpopular in London and Washington by gathering politicians from around the world and forming them into his Commission for Disarmament and Security, which the Americans thought was nothing more than a front for Soviet interests. They thought that Palmer was under the thumb of the Commission's two Soviet delegates. Different movements. You cannot reach security by increasing the arms race, piling ever larger quantities of weapons. You have, as I said, to try to reach security together with your opponents and start a downward spiral of armaments instead. And, and this, to this process, we hope that the Commission can make a modest contribution. Palmer's conclusions seem self-evidently true, the hindsight of 30 years. But back then, it was regarded as dangerously pacifist. This idea that security and nuclear age could not be achieved without cooperation and goodwill on both sides. It's true that Ronald Reagan came to a negotiated approach with Soviet leaders in the late 1980s, but the CIA were never on the same page as the politicians. For them, as well as for MI6, the Cold War was eternal. Let us be aware that while they preach the supremacy of the state, declare its omnipotence over individual man and predict its eventual domination of all peoples on the earth, they are the focus of evil in the modern world. Let's remember the exact point in time when Reagan was making his remarks, followed a few months later by the submarine intrusions over in Sweden. The early 1980s was the coldest part of the Cold War. Reagan called the Soviet Union an even empire, and archives have later shown that the Soviets thought Reagan was quite literally mad. As Reagan increased the pace of rearmament in Europe by placing out missiles, public opinion found itself at odds with NATO member governments, which largely acquiesced in the American wishes. There were peace marches all across Western Europe and Palmer, before office, was an enthusiastic supporter. Almost alone among West European leaders, he aligned himself with a peace protest movement. When a number of Scandinavian women marched from Copenhagen to Paris in 1981, Palmer took time off from his visit to Mitterrand to see the crazy Nordic women. Peace was a big issue in the elections of 1982 that brought Palmer back to power. In his campaign speeches around Sweden, he frequently mentioned the world's danger of destruction by nuclear war. He and his peace commission had just visited Hiroshima. In this Cold War climate, many of Palmer's political opponents, as well as the military and police in Sweden, thought the peace movement and Palmer were at best naive, at worst working in the interests of the enemy. Reagan's dictators with their cut fingernails and soothing tones of brotherhood and peace obviously could not be appeased in the way Palmer was doing. The fact that the Soviets seemed to be expanding in Scandinavia with their submarine harassments showed how Palmer's peaceful dialogue approach only encouraged the Soviets to do their worst. The Americans and British were, by their submarine operations, in other words, discrediting Palmer and through him any politicians in Europe who wanted to have a dialogue with Moscow. But by raising the level of conflict with Moscow, the Americans and British were making the world a nervous and tense place. Hello. Um, in the event of a nuclear war, where will you be? <laughs> oh my goodness me! I should be in London. Oh, don't you have your own bunker or something? When you hear the attack warning, you and your family must take cover at once. Do not stay out of doors. If you are caught in the open, lie down. They take about 30 minutes to reach their target. So do theirs, right? That's a warning, this is me. All confidence is high. I repeat, confidence is high. Roger, we've got 32 targets in track and 10 impacting points. I want to confirm, is this an exercise? Roger, copy. This is not an exercise. Roger, understand. Major Reinhardt, we have a massive attack against the U.S. at this time. ICBMs. Numerous ICBMs. Roger, understand. Over 300 missiles inbound now. 
world never came to nuclear war, but we now know that the warriors were nearer to the truth than they could have imagined. We had the massive military rearmament, which everyone could see, the cruise missiles at Greenham Common, and then, secretly, Reagan, Casey and Lehman carried out a war of covert operations and psychological warfare against the Soviet Union and friends that almost became too successful for its own good. It had the effect, apparently, of making the Politburo think a nuclear first strike was genuinely on the American agenda. The senescent Brezhnev had been replaced by Yuri Andropov, who was dying of kidney disease even as he took office. A former KGB chief, he had an extremely dark view of the West. Soviet paranoia came to head during Operation Abel Archer, which was a command and control exercise among NATO nations, which included a simulated nuclear strike on the Soviet Union. The Soviets knew it was an exercise, but because it was so realistic, and because the Soviets themselves, in their attack plan, planned to use regular military exercises as a cover for their real invasion, they suspected NATO would do the same. Soviet jets were fueled up and forces in East Germany were on high alert, when the NATO exercise ended on schedule a few days before the deadline the Soviets had set themselves. Historians have since debated whether this was the most dangerous moment of the Cold War. There was another nuclear war scare that autumn, 1983, when a missile warning station near Moscow detected incoming American missiles. The colonel in charge took a second look and guessed that the Soviet satellites were giving false readings, which indeed they were. He too has been credited with saving the world, because if you told the very ill Andropov there is no guarantee the erroneous report would not have provoked the Soviets to get their retaliation in first. Oleg Kalugin, former KGB chief, wrote in his memoirs, The danger was in the Soviet leadership, thinking, The Americans may attack, so we'd better attack first. The Abel Archer incident has been credited with making Reagan and Thatcher take the danger of a nuclear conflict very seriously and to listen to the Soviet leadership. They had a mole inside the KGB called Oleg Gordievsky. The CIA and MI6, who ran covert operations, though, may have continued to be rather more suspicious of potential Soviet deceit. In the autumn of 1985, the worst part of the Cold War was over. Gorbachev was in power and Reagan and Gorbachev had their first encounter in Geneva. The differences were huge, but at least the first contacts had been made. Hardliners on both sides tried to cast doubt on either side's bona fides but things were at least going in the right direction. In Sweden, however, where Palmer just won another term, the country still seemed gripped in a Cold War state of mind. Palmer stood foursquare against economic Thatcherism sweeping the rest of Europe, which annoyed the business community. But then he also had personal failings. He could be intensely self-righteous. He had a grating tone of voice and often liked to lecture people. But the continuing submarine intrusions and Palmer's inability to deal with them were perhaps the most important factor that enervated the general public, whipped up by pro-NATO media to be scared of the Soviets. Those parts of the Navy that were not aware of the secret deals between the top brass and the US-UK who carried out these operations were radicalised by the submarine intrusions and blamed all of Palmer. Officers in the intelligence services interpreted Palmer's approaches to Gorbachev as threats to Sweden's independence. Gorbachev was an unwritten card at the time. There was a meeting set up for April 1986. They were going to talk about peace. In the heated, tense atmosphere of Sweden at the time, however, the media and military thought he was going to surrender Sweden's independence. On 10th of November 1985, 12 Navy officers appeared in the Svenska Dagbladet newspaper. They said they couldn't trust Palmer. He didn't take the so-called Soviet submarine intrusion seriously. His critics feared that a neutral Sweden could be more easily absorbed into the Soviet sphere of influence. Why had the submarine intrusions not pushed Palmer into the Western camp, they wondered. In a speech in Stockholm a month later, Palmer responded to his critics. He spoke at the Foreign Policy Institute in Stockholm. He said he was going to maintain Sweden's neutrality and re-establish good relations with the Soviet Union. In Moscow, come I say, att vi i Sverige vill ha goda förbindelser med detta land. Jag kommer att understryka att dessa förbindelser måste byggas på en grundval av ömsesidig respekt för folkrättens grundregel. This document labeled cosmic top secret from NATO shows how worried NATO leaders were. The UK delegate said SPM, Swedish Prime Minister, trip to Moscow posed the greatest danger to NATO 
and there was a threat that Palmer would pull Norway and Denmark out of the organisation and into the Soviet orbit. NATO had to coordinate a threat reduction plan to Palmer's visit, and the exit plans of Norway and Denmark had to be foiled. It's never been proved that there were any exit plans, but that was the fear then. Tensions were heightened when a British military historian, wrongly a few weeks before the murder, said that the Swedes had caught a Soviet submarine in Horsfjorden but let it go. His statement was given a lot of play in the Swedish media. But was this a British intelligence psychological operation? An activist called Anders Larsson, who had right-wing connections and was the Swedish representative of an organisation called the World Anti-Communist League, went to the Swedish Foreign Ministry and to the Swedish Prime Ministerial Chancellery with two identical letters, each of which contained a photocopy of a clipping of the death of Palmer's uncle, also called Olof, in battle in 1918 as a volunteer in the civil war in Finland. The story sounds unbelievable, but the receipt of these letters before the murder has been confirmed by officials. The headline in the clipping was Olof Palmer shot. It was meant as a warning. He'd heard the news from a friend who owned an antique shop near the police headquarters and heard rumours circulating about Palmer's impending assassination. Anders Lawson wasn't the only one who had prior warning. There was also Ivan von Biershan, a Yugoslav former mercenary turned doorman who said he'd been approached by someone whom he said was from the CIA in November 1985 with the offer to be a gunman. I spent a recent winter's day with Biershan, a slightly clownish character, but also very intelligent. We started off at the central station and strolled across to the graveyard where Palmer was buried, and then the murder scene. Who's killed by Swedish secret police, done the job, and this is CIA who ordered Swedish secret police to be killed. That was not South Africa, that was not Chile. On 28th of February, His Excellency, Mr. Palmer, phoned to his son Martin, and they will come here and watch film uh, Brudana, Brothers Mozart. What happened? Here people saw it, many individuals with walkie-talkie. Hello, if that was Christy Peterson who plays them, with many walkie-talkie. And he, uh, what's called, he was here with, together with his wife and his son Mar uh, Martin. Martin gone on his side, home somewhere where he live, I don't know. And uh, Mr. Olof Palme and Mrs. Elizabeth continued to walk via Wegen straight there. After we'd visited the Grand Cinema, we strolled down to the junction where the murder took place. There's a plaque with Palmer's name on it, and a bit of contemporary Sweden intruded. A doll office had just opened up, and there were queues, a reminder that Sweden has changed in the 30 years since the Cold War. First, I desert from Yugoslav Armed Forces, 1973, uh, political reason. And I was in Africa, inclusive I was in South Rhodesia. And I have other names. November, approximately 15 November, 1985, in Hotel Continental, the man, okay, which I know for many years ago, uh, his one name was uh, in South Rhodesia, Charles Morgan, in Libya, Peter Brown, etc. He was CIA agent. And my man is innocent. They just give him mission to do it. He was in Vietnam, in Greenbury. He was helicopter pilot. He uh, had been using in South Rhodesia to throw Zanu Zapu prisoners of war from helicopter from high altitude. He teach baboons to fly. Uh, he was suitable, if I can, suitable subject for uh, the job which his company, by name CIA or State Security of the United States, gave him to do it because he was used. Charles Morgan asked Birshan what weapon he would use to kill someone. He made the jokes in the same time. And do that moment we have been discussed about weapons, about distance, about uh, uh, what's called temperature of the wind, about uh, how is going the stuff, about if that is sniper, if it will be spotter with the binoculars, if that will be two person, one person, uh, who going to be in question, has it you did need to know. You didn't need to know, but how, how, which way was the best? 
Did you wonder what he was doing and what he was trying to do with you? No, that time. Because I believe a possible man will give me some kind of job. But I mean, not in crime way. Uh, he will give me some decent job which I can make moral money. The second meeting took place on the 7th of January 1986 at the Hamlet restaurant in Stockholm. Charles Morgan explained he was serious. Um, when did he first mention Olaf Palme? Uh, that was January 1986 when he showed me the envelope, which was envelope, I mean a little bit bigger than A4. Uh, and she showed me Olaf Palme photo uh, and that was showed me I mean the geographical card of Stockholm and the different points and with following text on English when Olaf Palme walk every routines like I show you I tell he told me listen if you want to do mission you can you are very capable I talk with the company and he told me listen Stupid, stupid, you can get two million US in God we trust. You can get weapons, they will contact you. And I guarantee you that Olof Palme will not have this evening bodyguard. He paid the bill. What happened then? He cut contacts with me. CIA NATO, I don't think we should be hung up about the difference. The point is, Palmer's enemies came from the West, us. Minus 0,8. He understood that Really, Cold War leads to a dead end. And his major idea was a new concept of security. Common security. It's a rather simple one, but it was worked out in this report more or less in details. What on built a key, myslitlim, gumanistam, gum. И он понимал, что его роль может быть только вот такой. Через идеи, через предложения, через инициативу. И это он делал. И поэтому это как раз очень важно и ценно. Gorbachev, who is still active, certainly thinks the murder was carried out by the enemies of peace. Time to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. This is why I'm... What are the conclusions to be drawn from this? Donald Trump, whatever his faults, was elected partly because he promised a kind of detente with Russia after this absurd new Cold War broke out. Even his opponents on the left, who hate his immigration politics and his alleged sexism, praise him for this. But all those early days, it seems Trump is facing an uphill struggle, with the CIA using the media to brief against him. There are unproven allegations about sexual blackmail, a dossier compiled by a former British intelligence officer. JFK, like Palmer, also sought detente with Russia and was killed. It remains to be seen whether Trump will face down the deep state and manage to de-escalate tensions with Russia. Reagan did, but then he did have an ally Gorbachev who had heard Palmer's seductive talk that a better, more peaceful world was possible. Palmer's example was that talking was good. It defeated, in the end, the warmongers, but Palmer died for it.